Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today, we are going to be focusing on one of the most famous passages of Scripture. It's one that I'm sure all of you have heard multiple times before. It's a passage that really impacts this church from the simple fact that our vision is derived from this passage. And it's our gospel lesson for today, the Great Commission, where Jesus tells his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. I want us to spend time on this today because as we've been talking this week, this month, about how disciples learn from Jesus, we need to understand that sometimes we have passages of Scripture we think we know that we really don't know. And that we need to be listening to all of what Jesus says and learning from all of what Jesus says. And I believe that the Great Commission is one of those passages in Scripture. We look at a small portion of it, and we don't understand all of it in its context. And so today I want us to focus on that as we learn from Jesus. Now just a little bit of background before we get into this of where we are in the story of Jesus. This is it. This is the end of Jesus' earthly ministry. Now obviously it's not it. He ascends into heaven. He's still alive. He's still God. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead. We know all this, but this is the end of his earthly ministry. He has completed every single task that he set out to do when he became man. When he gave up his throne in heaven and took on our flesh and experienced everything we've experienced. This is the completion of his mission here on earth to redeem and save. Now he continues to redeem and save the lost through his church, but he's about to ascend into heaven. He has already come, he's faced every temptation that you or I have ever faced. He has gone through every single emotion that you and I have ever gone through, including grief, Abandonment, anger, he's gone through all that. He has, he has felt physical pain and emotional pain and spiritual pain. As on the cross, he's forsaken by his father. He has healed the sick and the lame, given sight to the blind, restored hearing to the deaf, made the mute to speak. He has walked on water. He has calmed the storms. He has fed thousands of people with five loaves of bread and two fish. He has driven out demons. He's raised people from the dead. He has preached a gospel with authority and power that no one had ever heard before. A gospel of repentance and forgiveness and life. And then on Holy Week... He had entered into Jerusalem being praised as the king of the Jews, the conquering hero, only to four days later be betrayed, condemned, and crucified. Even though he was sinless and perfect, he became sin who knew no sin so that each one of us can have life. And three days after that death, he rose from the grave, conquering sin, death, and the devil once and for all, and giving victory to all who believe in him, including you and me here in this room. We have that victory because Jesus accomplished the mission. We have that victory because he has declared us clean and pure and righteous in spite of all of our uncleanliness, all of our unrighteousness, and all of our failures. He's declared us that because of what he has done for us. And then 40 days, for 40 days after he rose from the grave, he continued to appear to his disciples to assure them that he was truly alive. He wasn't just a figment of their imagination. He wasn't just an apparition. He was real. He was alive. He was flesh. He was was bone. He was blood. Death had not conquered him. This passage is at the end of all of that. All of what Jesus has done. And as he's preparing to go into heaven, where he will remain until he comes again to judge the living and the dead, he has a few last words 
to share with his disciples. And that's the Great Commission. We're going to spend some time now on that passage today. I encourage you to go ahead and open up your pew Bibles. Or if you have a Bible on your phone or you have your own Bible with you today to go ahead and do that as well. If you're looking at your pew Bibles, it's page 1062. 1062. And we're going to look at verses 16 through 20 today. Once again, we have to remember this is all, Jesus has accomplished everything. He's done the work. The mission is finished. And now he's talking to his disciples. Beginning of verse 16, we read this. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Now this is an interesting way to begin this portion of scripture, right? Especially the some doubted. We'll get to that in a minute. But Jesus had sent his disciples to Galilee. They were in Jerusalem when Jesus died. They remained in Jerusalem until Jesus appeared to them. And after Jesus appeared to them, he said, go home. I'll meet you there. Galilee was way to the north of Jerusalem. That's where Jesus and the disciples lived. That's where Jesus grew up. That's where most of his ministry took place. we, We assume that most of his ministry took place in Jerusalem. That's not true. Holy Week took place in Jerusalem. Most of the rest of his ministry took place in Galilee. That is their home. So he tells his disciples, go home. I'm going to meet you there. And so they go to Galilee. They go to a specific mountain. We don't know what mountain it was. But they knew what mountain it was. So they go to this specific mountain and they meet Jesus there. And they see him and they do something incredible that they had never, ever, ever done before. They worshipped him. Up until this point in scripture, the disciples had not worshipped Jesus. They had understood him to be from God. They had believed that he was the Messiah. But they did not have the full grasp of who Jesus was until Jesus actually appeared after death. They, they, they understood he was something special, but they did not understand he was actually God until he rose from the grave. And that makes sense, right? He'd done all kinds of incredible things, but you could say, well, that's just God working through him. But when you ri- raise yourself from the dead, that's not just something that someone, anyone can do. Only God can do that. And so now, everything that they had seen Jesus do, everything that they had heard Jesus say, everything that they had read about in the Old Testament, in, the, in their scriptures before Jesus, all was changed, and they saw in a different light because Jesus had risen from the dead. And they realized he was indeed God, not just from God, but God himself. And so they bowed down and they worshiped him. Because he's worthy of all worship and honor and praise. But we're also told here that some doubted Jesus. Now, this does not mean they did not believe. When it says some doubted Jesus, it's more like they were struggling. They were struggling with who Jesus was. And I use this as an example. We don't know for sure that James, Jesus' brother, was here on this mountain. We do know for sure that James, Jesus' brother, became the leader of the church in Jerusalem and believed in Jesus as his Lord and Savior. We know that. Was he here on this mountain? Not necessarily, but I, I think it's probably very likely. Imagine if your brother or sister was God. And you had been with them their entire life, and you, weren't, you didn't know that until you saw them raised from the dead. Would you struggle with that a little bit? Pro- probably, right? I mean, after all, if you look at James and some of Jesus' other brothers, they had seen Jesus get in trouble. When he was 12 years old and he ran away to the temple... Mary and Joseph were not happy with Jesus. If he's getting in trouble with mom and dad, then, you know, what makes him so special? Jesus was perfect. James was not. But it does not stop James, I'm sure, from thinking sometimes, that Jesus, ah, Mr. Goody Two-Shoes, never, never, always, I always get in trouble, he never gets in trouble. Right? Or because James was a simple person, even though Jesus was perfect, probably sometimes saying that Jesus always gets away with everything. He's as bad as I am. We know that's not true, but in sin we can say that, right? Especially if it's your brother. So it's not that they don't believe, it's that, wow, this person that I've known for 33 years as my brother is more than just my brother. He's actually God. 
So it's a struggle with, wow, the, the, full, the full grasp of what's going on. It's not an actual, I don't believe. And we know that because when Jesus then addresses his disciples, he's addressing everyone on that mountain, including the ones who are doubting. So Jesus, after we have this background here, the disciples are up in that mountain, they worship him, some doubt, and then Jesus addresses them. And he says this, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. A lot of times when we hear this great commission, we just listen to the go and make disciples of all nations. And that's right. I wanna be very clear before I say anything else. As the church of God, we are called to go and make disciples. Having said that, when we read this entire passage, it changes what that looks like in our lives. I want us to start by looking just at what Jesus says to bookend this great commission. The first sentence he says here is, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And the last thing he says is, I am with you always to the very end of the age. If we understand those two things, it changes how we look at things in between those two statements. First of all, Jesus has all authority in heaven and on earth. He is the one who created everything. He spoke creation into being. Just said the words and it happened. He breathed life into each one of you here in this room and into every human being that has ever lived. He has authority over that which he has created. He has authority over that which he has breathed life into. Everything, the sun, the moon, the stars, the nations, the people, everything and all of creation, he has authority over. Everything. Now, it's easy for us sometimes to say, well, then if he has authority over everything, why do bad things happen? Well, the answer to that is because God loves us enough that he actually gives us freedom where he, we're not puppets, he gives us free will. Adam and Eve chose in free will to disobey God, commit sin, and now sin has corrupted all of creation. But God is still in control. God still has command over everything. I don't know about you, but to me that's a great comfort. That as God calls me to go make disciples, he's in control. He's in charge. He has authority over everything. And that last sentence when he says, I am with you always to the very end of the age. The one who has authority over everything never, ever leaves you. You are never alone. You may be thousands of miles from the nearest Christian and everyone hating you because you believe in Jesus Christ. You are not alone because he is with you to the very end of the age. And those, it's, it's amazing as we look at those two things as well, is one, we know that the one who has authority is with us, but also it changes our framework of what it means to go and make disciples because he is already moving. He is already working apart from you and for me. He is already working in people's lives. He is already working in different communities. He is already at work in the world around us. He's not waiting for us to join him. He's already doing it. And as he invites us to join him, which he certainly does, we're joining him in his work. Which is important that we differentiate between his work and our work. His work is the hard work. His work is the saving work. His work is the redeeming work. You will not save anyone. You will not redeem anyone. He does the hard work. We have the easy work. Love people. Care for people. Share with people. With God being the one with all authority and being with us, it shifts our mindset of what it means to go and make disciples. And I'll talk more, hopefully I'll demonstrate what that means here in a moment. Okay, if you've not seen that already. <laughs> Verses 19 and going forward. 
Jesus then gives the Great Commission. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations. That's really the, the Great Commission. The baptizing and the teaching, we'll talk about in a moment. But the Great Commission really is just that. Go and make disciples of all nations. Now, how does this make a difference when we understand that, that Jesus is the one who has authority and that he is with us? Well, like I said, he's already, first of all, at work in the world around us. And now he invites us to come and join him in the work that he is doing. If you read the book, Joining Jesus on His Mission, which we read this summer, a lot of what I'm saying here today is going to be a repeat for you, but it's good for all of us to hear. He is already at work, and he's inviting us to go with him. And what I love here is this idea of go and make disciples. In the Greek, the word go is not the idea that you would leave everything behind and go to Africa and become a missionary. Some people are called to that. We have somebody here in this room. Jerry Rosamond is called to be a missionary. There are some people who are called to that. Most of us aren't. And that's, that's fine. Going and making disciples does not mean that, uh, uh, that you have to go and put something extra on your schedule and go on the street corners and preach. Some people have that gift. Some people should do that. Most of us don't. Okay? But when we are going with Jesus, what he is saying here is, as you go about your life, make disciples. Don't change what you're doing. You don't have to add something new to your schedule. You don't have to become a missionary in a foreign field. You simply live out your faith in your relationships with other people. As you are doing your work, as you are doing your school, as you are doing your parenting, as you are doing your friending with people, as you are doing anything in your life, you can be going and making disciples by simply loving people the way that Jesus has loved you. It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be complicated. Loving people as Jesus has loved you. Caring for people as Jesus has cared for you. And yes, when the opportunity presents itself to verbally share what you believe, then doing that as well. But making disciples, going, while you are going about your daily life, it's not that you have to change anything except your mindset. Then everything you are doing, you are representing Christ. And you get to love people with the love that Christ has given you. Go and make disciples. While you are going about your daily life, make disciples. Share the hope that you have in Christ Jesus through how you treat others, through how you love others, through how you pray for others, through all those things. And the reason I like talking about this great commission in this way it's because one, I believe it's accurate, but two, none of you are off the hook. Sometimes we look at these passages and we say, yes, go make disciples. Pastor, that's why we hired you. That's why we have people like Jerry Rosamond. He's a missionary. He's going to go and he's going to do that. That's why we have people who have gifts who are evangelists because uh, they, they are gifted with evangelism, so they should go on the street corners and go knock on doors and go, and, and they're, they're going to do that. I don't have to do that. That's not my gift. Wrong. When we look at the Great Commission this way, none of you are off the hook. You don't have to have special gifts. You don't have to have special skills. You don't have to have a special call. While you are going about your daily life, about your normal life, you are making disciples of all nations. It's a change of mindset nothing else. And once again, if, if we remember what I said earlier today, again, it, it's him doing the hard work of saving people. It's us simply loving people and sharing the hope that we have with people. But none of us are off the hook from that. And then he wraps it up. The, this great commission is wrapped up after he says, go while you are going, make disciples of all nations. He then says how to do that baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything that I have commanded you. 
So baptism. We bring people here who believe in Jesus, whether they're infants, older, whatever age you are, you believe in Jesus, you've not been baptized, we will baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Most of you, if not all of you in this room, have been baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. You are disciples of Jesus, that is what has happened for you. And we understand that. But sometimes I think we neglect that second part of, of that passage, of this verse as well, where, we are, where Jesus says, Teach each other. Teach people what I have commanded. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to teach one another. Specifically here in this congregation, I have been called as your pastor to preach and administer the sacraments and teach and equip you. All of you, though, have responsibilities to teach others faith as well. Some of you actually will do that here at church. Uh, I was pointing out Randy Christie was at worship earlier today. Randy Christie taught class this morning. In a few weeks, Chad Churchill will be teaching a class this morning, uh, in the morning. So some of you are called to actually teach here, but but some of you don't have those gifts, some of you don't want to do that. Are you a parent? Are you a grandparent? Do you have a niece or a nephew that is very close to you? If so, teach them. Teach them what God has done for them. Teach them what God calls them to do. Teach them. As disciples of Jesus, we are to go and make disciples. Baptizing them and teaching them. As we look at the Great Commission and we dig deeper into all these verses here, we see that this Great Commission, in my view, is a lot more freeing and a lot more clear on who we are to be and how we are to live out our faith. But it also is much more convicting because we can't pass the buck to someone else. This Great Commission is for all who are disciples of Jesus. My prayer for us as a church is that we would join Jesus in the work that he is doing. That we would love our neighbors the love of Jesus while we are going about our daily life making disciples. That we would teach one another, encourage one another in faith, and grow in our faith. And that as we do that, God would grow us and he would grow his kingdom. He's at work And he invites us to come along with him as he gives us this commission. So go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them all of the commands of Jesus. And as you go, know that the one who has authority over everything in heaven and on earth is with you even to the very end of the age. Amen. And now may this God of grace and mercy who calls us and invites us to come with him on the work that he is doing be with you and strengthen you in your daily life. Amen.